Hello, and welcome to Retro Ramble. I'm Charlie McGee. I'm George McGee. This episode, as might have been given away by its title, is a review of 2018. We do these every year. Well, we've this done is them. our second year <laughs> running. <laughs> so this is the second one. Um, and what we do in this episode is a break from our typical looking back at the films of 80s and 90s. We take a look back at the films of this year. So the biggest blockbusters, uh, or the best things that have been on streaming services, or anything else that has piqued our interest. So in this episode, we will be uh, trying to keep the review short. We will be covering some films that we've been talking about in our recent Ramble episodes. So if we are brief about these specific films, it's most likely because we don't want to repeat ourselves too much and we'll just stick to the salient points. So in kind of, is it chronological? I think so. I think so. I mean, we might be jumping around a little bit, but uh, it's, it's chronological for the best part. Yeah, so in we will be announcing them. So for those of you who, you know, don't want to have any film spoiled, uh, we'll announce each film before we start talking about it. Uh, the ones that we've covered before will be brief, so it'll be things like uh, Ready Player One, uh, Black Panther, uh, Infinity War, A Quiet Place, Deadpool 2, Incredibles 2, Mission Impossible Fallout, Bohemian Rhapsody, and then we'll be talking about a number of other releases like uh, The Predator, Jurassic World 2, Equalizer 2, Ant-Man, and The Cloverfield Paradox, as well as probably awarding a few of these films with some made-up awards of our own. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the less blockbustery films that have been out as well, so more sort of art house, uh, but don't worry, we don't spend too much time on those either. Yeah, so yeah, it's obviously different from our, our typical retro episodes where we've got years of history and... Yeah, in um, obviously with the, the usual retro ramble, we go into uh, massive spoiler territory. We're going to try where possible with these films uh, not to delve too much into spoilers. Um, but as Charlie was saying, we will announce each film um, as we go into it. So if you haven't seen it and want to go in uh, spoiler free, you know, just uh, skip ahead by five minutes or so. Yeah, because, uh, you know, we're doing this just to review these films, just in the same way we review the films of yesteryear. We're just basically telling each other what we think, so uh, we hope you enjoy it. Um, just a an, an housekeeping note, um, due to logistics and locations, Charlie and I have uh, recorded this uh, over a Skype call, because Charlie lives in Paris, I live in Newcastle. So. I was literally phoning it in. So Charlie was, yes, literally phoning it in. So there isn't, isn't the best audio quality, uh, but we've cleaned it up and spruced it up uh, as much as we can. And George is crystal clear. Clear. So you still get to hear George's dulcet tones. I just sound, I still sound fabulous. Yeah, I just sound like I'm uh, I'm 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 on the M4 and I'm going nowhere. I, I like to think you were in a phone box somewhere in Paris. Yeah, very alone. Yeah, in a very very alone, just surrounded by the gilets jaunes. Mm. Um, okay, so without further ado, here is our review of the biggest films, our review of 2018, and we hope you enjoy it. Enjoy. <laughs> The, the list that we have is practically chronological. There might be a few sort of things out there. But yeah, let's start with Ready Player One. So we went to see this together, didn't we? We did, and I think it was our first dipping of the toe into our spin-off show, uh, Recent Ramble, the, the show that nobody asked for. But yes, we were both very much looking forward to this film. We both read the book years previous. And obviously with Spielbergo involved, it was a, a must-see for us, wasn't it? Yeah, because he'd been... Is he, I don't know if he's still considering doing uh, Robo-Apocalypse, but there was there was this, there was Robo-Apocalypse, and there was World War Z, which were all books that I think you and I read at the same time. And you were like, oh, they're planning on making movies of all of them. And it seems like... Well, I mean, World War Z was made, but Ready Player One is the only film that's been made that seems to have kind of, I think, fed the anticipation of those that read the book. 
Yeah, well, I mean, amazingly, on, on the sidetrack of World War Z or World War Z, depending on, on how pedantic you want to be, but they are, I think they are actively pushing ahead with the sequel. But interestingly, it's going to be directed by David Fincher. So it's a, a bit of a reunion of sorts of David Fincher and Brad Pitt. So if they can actually go back to the source material of the book, which they pretty much ignored in the first World War Z or Z, it might be interesting. But anyway, getting back to uh, Ready Player One, yeah, it, I think it's it's safe to say that we both really enjoyed it. Um, it was a, a you know great cinema experience. It's amazing visuals, some really cool. I mean, well, the film's all about Easter eggs, but there is so much for for the eyes. It's, it, it is truly a feast for the eyes, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, as we said, we. I mean, I actually haven't seen it since we saw it at the cinema. So it's almost a year now, and I'm looking forward to seeing it again and then picking up on stuff. Uh, the second time round. But yeah, I, I was very happy with the way that the pop culture references were dealt with because obviously there was so much. And I think you and I both went in realizing that when you are, when, you, when you're covering so many pop culture references, there's no way you're going to make everybody happy. There was always going to be somebody, oh, I didn't like the representation of of this arcade game, but we loved it. I mean, we, we definitely enjoyed both the plot and the, the visual side of it, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think, and we, uh, you know, we probably did talk about this in, in the, the full-length episode, but you can't please everybody. And there, it, there were parts of the novel that was unfilmable. Um, I remember one of our, our guests on, on the show this year, Andrew Hughes, uh, a.k.a. Hughesy, I remember him saying to me, oh, should I, should I read the book before the film comes out? And I was like, oh, I don't know. It's, it's quite geeky. Uh, and I was like, you know, to, to give you an example of how geeky it is, there's stuff that even went over my head. And he was like, oh, OK. Um, <laughs> and you really are a nerd. It, exactly. So, yeah, I think that, yeah, there's, there's obviously stuff in the book that wouldn't translate well to film. And they've obviously had to cut a few corners. They've mo- had to move the plot around to accommodate. But I think, yeah. I but think it made money. Yeah, I it think made so, money enough. Yeah, I don't think it was a like I don't think it was a failure by any means, but I don't think I don't know whether it it should have garnered more attention, you know, with the what was on offer, who was involved, but I think probably the the one thing that's the main draw works against it is it is a little bit geeky and there might be just some stuff that goes over people's heads. Yeah, I I I think there were I think you could you could feel it in the critics that that after the you know, quite a lot of time has passed since we saw it since we reviewed it and i think you can see if you look but read between the lines it's kind of like yeah there's a lot of stuff in there and everyone's saying the same thing there's a lot of stuff in there that even i didn't get like yeah but come on you know the set pieces you know without going into any spoilers at the end but you see it in the trailer but they've even put in some pop culture references from things like overwatch which is a game that came out a couple of years ago which there was no need to do but they were just trying to say hey new geeks hey millennial you know like it was it was trying to cater to a certain type of the audience but um, I was going to say, I think it, it has made enough money and I think they are planning to make a sequel. I have no idea what they're going to call it, George. Any ideas? What could they possibly call it? I don't know where they would go. Press, ready... press start button. <laughs> press start button. <laughs> ready, ready, player three. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, th- I think, yeah, I, I, I too haven't seen it since we saw it together at, at Easter. I'm more than happy to, to wait a while and wait for it to either on on Netflix or or Blu-ray but yeah I'm happy to wait a while for that but I did yeah I say I did enjoy it okay and next up we have Black Panther and so Black Panther is a film that we are wondering how many awards is it going to get or miss this year Uh, yeah it will be interesting to see how many Oscars it will be nominated for so the I think the Golden Globe Awards have have been announced very recently and I haven't checked that because the Golden Globes are just very silly but yeah it's kind of like I got somebody told me that it's like they start with the after party of who they want there and then they work back (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's 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 i don't think anyone really takes it very seriously and it's sort of whatever you want to put your film into whatever character you want to put your film into will will be fine so I, cause I think from from recent memory the the martian was put under best comedy or musical <laughs> and it's like um uh, pretty okay. sure it's a science fiction film <laughs> but anyway um yeah black panther big deal for the industry because it was a predominantly black cast and crew 
for a huge Hollywood, you know, $200 million uh, blockbuster. And that wasn't enough. It was a really good film as well. It's great. Yeah, I, great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, obviously, it was getting loads of hype. And I'm glad to say it sort of lived up to those expectations. Um, I, yeah, I yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it from from start to finish. I best described it to my wife when she was like, oh, well, what's it about? And I was like, it's, it's kind of like The Lion King, but with real people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's a very good very good um, synopsis but yeah I thought um, all involved were, were great Chadwick Boseman obviously the, the always reliable uh, Michael B. Jordan and some really good action great soundtrack I've actually had uh, I'd actually been listening to, to that soundtrack quite a bit the following months um, what the Lion King yeah, you, well, I'm all, I've always got my musicals <laughs> on the go, Charlie. You know me. I have a flair for the dramatic. Uh, I think the and I, I think you and I were in agreement with this. The only sort of in terms of weaknesses was the sort of generic CGI heavy finale of of that Marvel issue of a the villain it has very similar powers to the hero and then just duking it out. Well, there is a certain element to that in a lot of Marvel films, which it kind of reminds me of Austin Powers, where. Uh, Dr. Evil is throwing out these ideas. Should we do this? Should we do that? And everyone's saying, no, it's been done. It's been done. And I get the feeling it's like that in the Marvel office. It's sort of like, okay, what the hell? Why don't we just have a big showdown in the sky over a city with lots of CGI? It's like, yeah, okay, let's do that. It's it seemed time and time again, because I watched um, uh, Ragnarok recently, um, which is something else, obviously, that we've, that we've covered in our recent rambles. Um, but it's, it's interesting how the Marvel do kind of that. That's the only criticism you could level at, at Black Panther. But how else could have it, it have ended and continue in the shared universe? And also, you kind of get this feeling they built this world, you know, this Wakanda. They, they built this world that was so big and so developed that it, it could actually maintain an entire uh, film plot. Because they don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of it occurs in Wakanda. I mean, they're, they're yeah. Popping. Well, no, I, th- I think that was the the one refreshing thing that was very little links to the other films. It felt at this late in the stage in the game and in the lead up to Infinity War, there was very little sort of universe building. There was yeah a few links, but it was very self contained, which I think a lot of people found refreshing. Yeah, yeah. So without spoiling it too much, if you haven't seen it, go see it. And if you have seen it. Um, hope you enjoyed it. One thing I wanted to say about Black uh, Panther is, don't you remember the the effect uh, in the beginning when he's picking up the little trucks and he's taking the roof off to look at the men in the trucks? It's like oh, a, yeah, yeah. It's like a 3D Etch-A-Sketch live thing and he's like picking up the trucks and he's looking at the soldiers inside with his hands. Um, was Marvel really flexing their CGI muscle in, in, in what they can do these days? Yeah, I think that was one of my, my few hang-ups about the film was the the, the magic MacGuffin of Vibranium. <laughs> was vibra- Vibranium whatever you wanted it to be. Yeah, yeah it's um, it's technology, it's armour, it's... it's me- oh, fuck it, it's medicine as well. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll cure bullet shots. Yeah, it'll be fine. Because, because Vibranium. Because yeah. Vibranium. <laughs> exactly, because Vibranium. So, yeah, that was... Well, I suppose that neatly segues into Avengers Infinity War. And now, I don't know, in terms of spoilers, when it comes to Avengers Infinity War, I think everybody who wants to see this film or is interested in this, this film has either seen it or kind of knows what goes on. But And it's on that- home entertainment now, so even if you're people like us that have have children and struggle to get out to the cinema, you would have, if you really wanted to see it, you would have seen it by now. Exactly. But it's obviously done the numbers in terms of success, but it also delivered for, you know, we won't go into too much detail, but I mean, with that ensemble cast, it did what everyone thought wasn't possible, which it made a coherent, enjoyable action movie without... With, with and managed it with maintaining all of these all these massive list of characters. Well, can I just quote myself from uh, our our actual special on it? It was it did feel like the that last act of Return of the Jedi stretched across uh, an entire film. You had yeah multiple stories, uh, action scenes all happening at once and coherently and fluidly. And yeah, it was just. I think everything you wanted in, in that film, everything it could be. I don't think there was really any flaws apart from if you were new to the the Avengers world, you would be completely bamboozled. But it is a accumulation of, was it 18, 19 films? 
You'd be like, I'm just trying to, if you think of Joe Public, like everyone knows who Spider-Man is. I just think it's a funny thing. Like if you'd never seen any Marvel film, you know, like this being out recently and you went to see Avengers, you'd be like, who are all those guys? And why isn't Spider-Man more of this Spider-Man film? Yes. <laughs> you know, because he's the most recognizable and the least developed or the least featured, you know, yes, he's got a few films under his belt, but they've spent so much time on everybody else in this, MCU, you know, and he's there, but he still seems quite new. And obviously, it brought the evil, evil Paddington character, Ebony. E- what's he called? Children of Thanos. <laughs> uh, e- e- Ebony Moore. Oh, we loved him, didn't we? Both oh, yeah, he, he was. He was a. He was a definitely a highlight for me. He was so evil, and I was actually Need quite. Need a standalone film. <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely. If 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 it is, you know, the era of spin off, we need yeah a, a prequel with with Ebony Moore, just him going around, just being really evil, just 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 throwing things at people. Yeah, it's like whoa, telekinesis. Just him and Charles Xavier going at it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, next up, we have a quiet place, which I'm not sure. Have you seen that yet? I have not. I'm still far too scared. I'm I'm just not ready yet. I just don't well, want to watch it alone. <laughs> no, it. the thing is, it's great tension. It's great suspense. Uh, but nobody told me anything about this film. Uh, so I'm not going to tell anybody about some apart from that it's good. The only thing I would throw in is that if people are like, oh, I'm too tired to watch the film, it is a short film. Uh, it's definitely under 90 minutes, but it's compact. It's well succinct. And it is um, a great, a very great storytelling. Um and I and I don't want, I don't want to ruin anything else about it. But uh, Emily Blunt and uh, Mr. Muppet knows what uh, reminds me of this. John Krasinski, Jim from the American Office, and he's also the current holder of the title of Jack Ryan. Yeah. So proving his proving his capabilities, I actually really like him. I know we keep talking about his nose. He, I really he like does, him. He does have a Muppet's nose, but he is a, a talented actor. Very good. Very. Uh, and he is married to Emily Blunt, so you know respect. Oh, so they, that, that, well, they did well with that chemistry then, because um, yeah, no, it was. I I did not know that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and obviously, yeah, she's. I think she is very. I would say very underrated, but that seems ridiculous because <laughs> she's, she's in she's, so many films. She's just lovely. <laughs> she's just like no, a... but she's doing really well. She's the type of actress you might say, oh, she's so underrated. You're like, well, wait a minute, yeah, <laughs> you know, like well, if you look at the film she, she's yeah. been in, she's she's not underrated at all. And uh, uh, she's... obviously, she's going to go Stella with uh, Mary Poppins too. Is is going to come out in a matter of weeks and. That looks like it's getting some very good reviews, so I think that's going to be the big Christmas hit. So I think I haven't heard a bad word about that. Everyone is talking positively about it, and Emily Blunt as Mary Poppins got my vote. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, going from a quiet place to a very loud and obvious place is Deadpool Two. Did it have a colon, or was it just Deadpool 2? No, I think no, it was... It, was, it was very simply just Deadpool 2. I mean, I think Deadpool's always kept that sort of element of that old-school vibe and uh, old-school sort of 80s and 90s violence, and I think that's why, it, you know, it appeals to, to people like us. It's a, it's a very different approach to the whole Marvel model, even a very different approach to uh, the DC Deadpool 2 is a lot of fun. It's uh, you know it's very funny. Got some great action. It's more of the same um, in both a good way and a bad way. It's the, I think the only thing it really loses it, you know as a flaw is it just doesn't feel as fresh as the first one did. Yeah, and you know we we talked about that in the episode. But what I can say, which is what's happened since we we covered it, it's just it's amazing. The social media, the the viral, the PR stuff, the fact that. They've hijacked. Have you seen that he's hijacked the recent Avengers trailer? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. Like how how much. And there's even a, there's, there's another Deadpool film that's just come out. Yes. Like in the last few weeks. So there. So, yeah. I mean, this is. Um, yeah. I, I wrote about it on the uh, the blog, and I think I put a trailer on the blog, but. It is essentially a a family friendly recut of Deadpool two, and it's called Once Upon a Deadpool. And the main sort of hook and new footage they filmed is quite ingenious. That they've 
done a parody of the princess bride and um obviously the par- uh, the princess bride was had uh, the guy who played columbo i think is it peter folk chatting to a young telling the story to a young fred savage in his bedroom and uh, once upon a deadpool has deadpool telling the story to a very adult fred savage in exactly the same bedroom so <laughs> and yeah they they've they've made it like they've cut out all the a lot of the violence and the swearing for a aiming for a pg13 edit which they they got in the states but ironically it still was too strong for uk um classification system so it's still a 15 this this family friendly version in the uk was released for for one night only and it's something that i'm sure you and i would usually be quite cynical about but apparently ryan reynolds only agreed to do it uh, because it's raising money for his the cancer charity that he supports well there you go yes i mean i i'm just i'm you know as as both of us work in digital media it's it's impressive to see uh, how creative and original they've been with both the video with the cinema release and the video release and the streaming release and then Christmas. They've yeah, very, very organized. It will be interesting to see. I know there's it's still sort of a long way off, but this whole Fox Disney merger that is is going ahead, where how that will affect Deadpool, whether they will they keep him separate? Will he stop popping up in the Avengers and and, and if so, how will that work? So yeah, it's um it is interesting well, to see how, how how that will pan out, but I think that's obviously going to take some time for it to properly for the dust to settle on the ground. Well, yeah, without going out off on too much of a tangent, it does seem like we are moving into an all bets all bets are off sort of thing. You've got Endgame, you've got Avengers Endgame coming out, which is almost the end of an era. You've got Disney about to start its own streaming channel, and as a result, pulling all the Marvel series from Netflix. You know, so there's a lot. Really there's, about there's, that. there's a no, no, but George, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's all going to be on the Disney Channel next year when it comes out, and you're just going to have to get that. So, yeah, you've got. Uh, that's why I think it's happened. Then you've got Disney and Fox. So yeah, there does seem to be. Is that phase four? Should we really care? Anyway, enough about that. We'll, we'll probably cover that on the other episodes we do next year. So, next film would be Incredibles two. Which I I don't think you've seen. I still have haven't seen it. No, I uh, I would have I would have liked to, but I th- I just missed it at the cinema. It was just one of those things that you can't see them all. Well, yeah, and I don't. I, well, I mean, there's not a lot to say in that. It if 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 the first film is a nine out of ten, then this is an eight point five out of ten. I would re- highly recommend it. More of the same, just a very big break in between the two films, but. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's enjoyable, but like what we're saying about Deadpool, it's just lost some of the freshness. And I think you and I both loved all of the James Bond spy references and stuff. And the last third of the first Incredibles film is amazing for some animated jokes. Very, very well delivered. So, um, but highly recommend seeing that. Next up, we have Mission Impossible Fall Out. Fall yeah. out. And now, obviously, we've we've waxed lyrical about this film, but um, obviously it is a review of the year. And I'm sort of quite smug in the fact that I think at the start of the year, he said it was the film I was looking forward to most. And for me, yeah, it is uh, so far, you know, I mean, there's still a few more films, big films coming out before the end of the year. But for me, Mission Impossible Fallout is the, the film of the year for me in terms of... Uh, just pure enjoyment, cinematic experience, and it, it delivered. It's also strange in that they're both franchises. Like, we were just talking about Marvel a moment ago, and now we're talking about Mission Impossible going, so, well, yeah, it's just another franchise. But it's like, yeah, we the, it's been going on longer. There's been less films. And I don't know, there's just, there's just something about what I would say Tom Cruise and his production company, and then more recently with... Um, Christopher McQuarrie, what they've been able to produce together, you're like, oh, please just make more films like Edge of Tomorrow, Rogue Nation. Uh, what was the other one? Um, well, uh, they, did, they did the first Jack Reacher together. Yeah, which was which was good. They, they made Tom Tom Cruise as, as tall as he possibly could mm. uh, be for that film. No, I mean, uh, it's a great film, and uh, I think it will probably pop up later on when we're discussing like some of the awards of uh, what we think of yeah in t- yeah in terms of highlights of the year i mean I, it was you know just phenomenal and 
Yeah, I think, yeah, as you say, they've, they've got a good thing. Uh, Cruz and, and Macquarie, a, a writer, director and actor. So, yeah, long may it continue. I mean, um, yeah. Definitely st- filling filling a gap that's been left by, and we say this as adamant, 100% people, you know, Bond fans, we've been Bond fans forever, 30 plus years. Um, it's filling a gap. That it's just there's been no Bond film for a while, you know. The yeah, closest and, we've had is- and people have, as That's people it. said, it's it's captured the sort of the fun that is missing from the current uh, iterations of the Bond films. That the one thing that they're not really getting right with the Daniel Craig ones is they are quite gloomy and and po faced and a bit serious. But yeah, interestingly, for since Mission Impossible has been such a huge hit this year, usually, I think if it was any other film, the studio would be announcing, you know, plans for for a sequel. And whilst I think see it is a next mission will be guaranteed, Tom Cruise and it appears uh, Chris McQuarrie, I think he's on writing duties, is uh, busy working on Top Gun Two, um, but that's not going to be released until twenty twenty. Um, so yeah, they're filming it, aren't they? Yeah, they're filming it at the moment. Yeah, so it'll be whilst there's been no official announcement of the next mission, it will happen at some point. But uh, when that when that happens, it might not be for another year that they actually announce what's uh, what's the crack and what's going on. Well, no, they're de- they're definitely doing another one. If you've listened to any of the the mammoth, how many hours of the the Empire? I think it's about s- five or six hours worth of like, yeah. about, across three different podcasts. Yeah, so Empire Magazine, uh, who also have a podcast, have done a spoiler special um, with Christopher McQuarrie. And in that, he does discuss, well, yeah, that'll be the next one. So, I mean, they're committed to doing it, but yeah, they've got the project to yeah. do in the meantime. So next up, it's definitely not at, uh, alphabetically, but I think it's chronologically, we have Venom. So yeah, Venom we, we haven't talked about. I think we on our last recent uh, ramble, we we talked about we were we were looking forward to it. It had some very mixed responses to the trailers. The trailers made it look a bit crap. Um, uh, in, in official film industry speak, it, there was the will, will he, won't he, will Spider Man appear? And then the first sort of reviews started coming out. And yeah, you and I have, have chatted about this uh, a lot recently, and it just seems to be there's a lot of toxic sort of film reviewing at, uh, at the moment. It's a current trend, it's uh, people only seem to deal in absolutes that every film is either the best film ever or it's the worst film ever. There doesn't seem to be rarely anything in between because obviously if someone comments on a film and says, yeah, you know what, it's all right, it's not going to get picked up. It's not going to get shared. It's not going to get tweeted. And I remember when the first uh, initial reviews came in for Venom, somebody, I don't know if they were just a blogger, I don't think they were a proper sort of accredited critic, but it, it got it got trending because he said it's Catwoman level bad this film is an absolute disaster and yeah a lot of the initial reviews were saying it was really bad it, I think across the board it got fairly poor reviews but audiences completely defied it I mean a bit like The Greatest Showman earlier on in the year which got very mediocre reviews and has become the you know biggest sell one of the biggest selling albums of uh, of the year one of the the highest grossing films across the year you know they're still doing showings of it Venom proved the critics wrong that a lot of people enjoyed it it, it obviously worked with with the word of mouth and I did the same with you uh, you know you were like oh is it any good and I was like it's fun it's nothing it's not great it's not terrible but I, I enjoyed you know the hour and a half two hours of watching it well to, for me it's kind of like it's kind of like if if you like Tom Hardy go and see this film. I mean that that's the thing. I think a lot some people really don't like him as we know because we are part of some discussion groups that cover Bond and Tom Hardy's name comes up a lot and a lot of people are like meh and a lot of people are like I hate him. There and I don't know why that is. I think he's a very good actor. I think he's very he's very think- dedicated. He's very in, intense and I think that irritates some people because he he goes all in. Well, yeah, he's got a very big range, I would say. If you look at the performances he has done, I mean, I could name one or two films, but I mean, if you just look in in, in Inception, you know, he's actually playing a few different sides of the same coin. And then we've, you know, we've seen him in The Dark Knight. We've seen him, you know, do some do some great roles. But uh, have you seen when he does the Cray? 
the Cray brothers. Yes, uh, again, another double role. He, he loves a double role, does Tom. Yeah, I enjoyed the performance. I thought the film was that's, quite mediocre. But that's what I wanted to say about Venom is fine in terms of a, you know an action flick, and we're not ruining anything here, but if you want to see a great performance of of Tom Hardy playing a split personality or two roles within one. It's great for that. And it's fun as it should be in a sort of black comedy way. And the graphics are good enough. The plot is okay enough, but it does teeter into sort of B movie territory a little bit. In, oh, in oh, a little bit. It, it, it's, a, <laughs> it, it's a massive B movie. And I think that's what you've just got to take it, take it as face value. As you say, the plot's very, very formulaic. Uh, there is some, some shocking dialogue. It does feel like everyone else in the film is acting in a different film to Tom Hardy. <laughs> um, yeah. But he is brilliant. He's, he, you know, he gives it his all with his performances and he is the star of the show as both Eddie Brock and Venom. And the highlights of the film are those two bickering away with each other. And that was the kind of the, the thing that you and I loved about well, going back for nostalgia the the old 90s spider-man cartoon was the that when venom yeah i think that was our first sort of introduction to venom for, for you and i anyway well without going too geeky i mean that episode where he turns up is amazing that spider-man episode where they've sent the ships to mars it's similar to kind of species two and maybe another spider-man film the first was it spider-man three they kind of knock it off but the cartoon is that that cartoon that venom first features in is better than probably any Venom film that's been done to date. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that that's, yeah, part of me is um, is a bit sad that they, that, that storyline hasn't got the proper, still hasn't had the proper cinematic adaptation that, you know, if they, ha obviously Sony have, have played it safe by, and this is a minor spoiler by saying, you know, there's no references to Spider-Man in this, in this film. They've played it very safe. They've obviously left it open for the potential for Tom Holland uh, as Spider-Man to turn up in sequels. Yeah, I think it's it's a real missed opportunity that they haven't stayed closer to that source material. It could have been a lot more, I say, you know, a, a bigger deal, a lot more cinematic to, and, uh, you know, to tell that story. But Sony are playing within the confines of the, the sand pit that sort of Marvel have allotted them, so to speak. Until they can buy the franchise from them. Uh, so next up, it is Bohemian Rhapsody, which I, I saw recently. I don't know when you saw this. I think you saw you. you didn't you go to see this earlier? Yes, I was. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get an invite to the premiere at Wembley Arena through um, my good friend uh, Andy Fulton, who. Uh, works for for global radio it was an amazing experience the premiere because yeah i say it was at the arena there was about seven thousand people there and it was such a an experience experiencing the film the songs the hits people you know clapping and stomping along to to we will rock you the the film itself is quite safe and quite mediocre i'd say it's a a three-star film it's a very safe biopic but it's a very very good uh, central performance from rami malek the guy from mr robot he is is fantastic in the role uh, even if he's you know lip-syncing to freddie mercury but to be honest it's such it would have been sacri a, sacrilege to well, do anything it. else it's such an iconic voice i don't don't see how you could anyone could you know do the acting uh, and uh, carry out the singing of by themselves um and yeah you've got if you're a queen fan and i wouldn't say i'm a diehard queen fan but obviously you know you and i i remember you had was it greatest hits two or you might have had them both on on cd growing up um, i had i got in, i got into them yeah like way after the wave greatest hits two but massive fans and then you know, I think that's why that film probably did things for us that it didn't do for the absolute, you know, queen, queen fan. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, you've got all the hits in there and just seeing that is, there's a lot, you get a lot of fun out of it. But I say it's, the the storyline itself is all is all quite safe. And as you would expect when you've got the whole band involved, you know, I think Brian May is very protective of, their legacy um, and doesn't want it to be just, you know, about Freddie and him being 
a sexual deviant that we all knew and loved. <laughs> um, I, I, I almost think after seeing the film, though, that they should have called it Freddy. I don't know what you think about that, but because it's kind of, it is more about, it is more, it is obviously about him, but it is kind of it's about the message that he was bigger than Queen, that, it, that he was Queen. Well, sort of I, ironically, I don't know if there's any, how how much truth there is in this, but because but, it's been such a success, I mean, apparently it's the biggest musical biopic of, of all time. And I suppose because it's, they were one of the biggest. All the fans are going, all, and all the fans are going to see it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but there was, I'm sure I saw a headline recently that said, uh, Brian May feels that there is potential for a Bohemian Rhapsody sequel. It's like, what are you going to focus on? Nobody cares about when a queen after Freddie Mercury. Only real diehards do. But uh, yeah, you've you've pretty much told that story, even if you have told a very sanitized version. All I'd like to say is, out of all of the biopics that I've seen, I mean, I do know because I mean that was the great thing about having CDs. You'd get the album, you'd open the book, you'd look at the cover. I mean, I know exactly what. Um, not only what the band looks like, but I knew I know what they look like for each of those, you know, the yeah. scenes in the films that they're replicating. And one thing you've got to give hats off to this film uh, is the all of the actors are uncanny like versions of. Um, oh, the guy who plays Brian May is amazing. Like in terms you know, him of the, and, the him manner and all, yeah, the mannerisms, and also the other guy because um, isn't there two Rogers? There's uh, the drummer who I thought was the weakest. There's Roger Taylor, and then is the well, we're, we're now sharing our stripes now. We're not true Queen fans, uh, and I can't remember the, the other guy, by, the they bassist. Second, yeah, they call him by a second name, John, John Deacon. Deacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they looked almost like just carbon copies of Brian May and, and uh, Deacon. It was, it was, it was crazy. I just thought that the drummer looked a bit younger or less developed than the rest of them, but. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, somebody's put on uh, doing the rounds on social media that they've put side by side the real Live Aid performance and the performance from the film, and they're saying, you know, it's they have done it beat for beat. They have it is proper mimicry, but you know, hats off to them. It's that part, that whole sort of Live Aid section that, that the film closes on is really a joy to watch, and it's you know the whole sort of. Yeah, it's it's very nostalgic, but it, it's a, it's a great sort of moment for the film. Good good high point. I do think Rami Malek, you know, I'll be very disappointed if he doesn't get an Oscar nomination for it. I mean, I don't I don't think he'll he'll win it, but he, he definitely deserves a some recognition for for that performance. Yeah, but the the thing is, uh, I think he's a great actor. I, I mean, I loved him, and I love I think Mr. Robot. I don't think it realised how successful it was going to be. You know how grand designed, but he. You know, I, I lost interest anyway after I think I watched the first two seasons and I haven't been able to watch the third um, just because it felt like it was world building. You know, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm the same. I sort of lost. I, I've watched the first two series and they were brilliant, but it does feel like they're sort of padding it out and trying to. Build and, not in, and, and not interestingly enough, it's okay when they pad out and you love you love all the new characters and stuff. But he's been great and solid in that. He's been brilliant in this. And then the question is, because I think it popped up, he'd make a really good villain. Well, uh, like, yeah, no, I just I just talked about it on, on the blog just the other day that he is actually wanted by the Bond producers for the new Bond film, but they reckon that his they're filming the last season of Mr. Robot and that could clash with his schedule. But I think he'd be a great villain. He, you know, he's got that intenseness that would work well against I, Daniel Craig. I only have one proviso is that if he... From after his performance of Bohemian Rhapsody is the Bond villain, then I really want the guy from Downton Abbey, the Irish guy, to be his boyfriend, it, like even you know in character. But I, 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 I also chemistry. I also want the <laughs> the bad dentures as well at the start of uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Even though I think they they actually filmed the Live Aid stuff first and then worked backwards. Um, it feels like the first se- few scenes where you're seeing him as Freddie Mercury, he's still getting used to the dentures, and he's like, it's like he's got a gum shield in, and he's like <laughs> playing around with it in his mouth. So, yeah, I think, yeah, he needs the the gay lover from uh, from Downton, and he needs the dentures, because every Bond villain needs some sort of disfigurement. Or... Crutch. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty much most of the big 
uh, big, big, big blockbusters. Well, I, I mean, yeah, the, the, there are other films in there, but they, I think they fall into our more disappointments and some of them we've talked about. So there's Jurassic World 2, which, you know, gives it's more mindless dino action, some good there's you know, the odd good sequence, but as a whole is a bit underwhelming. I have not seen either Equalizer 2 or Ant-Man and the Wasp, but, but I remember you, you said you weren't overly keen on those films. Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, just, just because we've covered them in the recent Ramble episodes, I won't go into too much detail, but Ant-Man and the Wasp, it's a lot of filler, none of it matters, and um, yeah, it's you know it, it it is kind of enjoyable, but it's, it's a family film, great for. Um, but it's just weird that they went from Ant Man to this. They've completely changed audiences. Mm. Very very strange. And uh, equalizes. I was going to say, Sorry. I think I will see it because uh, in in Paul Rudd, I, I trust I do have a bit of a, a man crush on that man. He is he is very good in in even mediocre stuff. So I'm sure I'll, I'll seek it out at some point. No. I love him, but he's not in it enough. <laughs> I mean, that tells you something about this film. There's a lot of Evangeline Lilly, who is, you know, obviously very good and deserved the role and all of that. And then there's Michael Douglas, it's my head, it's not my body. <laughs> and then there's Michelle Pfeiffer, it's my name. <laughs> I'm not sure how much of her is actually... You can't tell the difference, but there's just a scene where Michael Douglas is walking towards Michelle Pfeiffer and you just know that they're floating heads and um yeah it's just him and another him in a some suit and it's just his head on the superimposed body and the, the body's like really tall and really muscly and nothing against michael douglas he used to be you know tall strapping man but he's not that physique now and it's just i don't think he was ever that tall i mean yeah he was obviously strapping at some point and in shape but uh yeah no, they're a tall family they're a tall family him and his dad they're all i over cannot believe foot. kirk Douglas is still alive at something like 100, 100, 120. Uh, I, I, he might be 105, but he's still going. But Douglas is great in it. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is great in it. And Paul Rudd is great in it. Oh, God, I forget the guy's name. The um, the, the guy who's he's in the new Narcos. He's called, da- is it David something? He's in everything. He keeps oh. popping Oh, the, the the wise talking psychic. Yeah, you know, because he turned up in a few Michael series. Michael Pena. Oh, that's it, sorry, David. Um, Michael Pena <laughs> popped, started, started popping up in films a few years ago as a solid sort of supporting character actor and is now being pushed full in front in the limelight. And I won't go off on a rant, but for me, this is positive discrimination at its, at its worst. You know, it's like, oh, he's Mexican. Oh, he's Latina. Put him in everything. Give him loads of screen time. And... I just he's like he's in everything, and I don't think he should have been pushed so much into the limelight. If you get what I mean, yeah. I think he's doing very well where he was, and that sounds horrible to say it, but it's almost like there's there's big chunks of that film which are dedicated to him and for his comedy, and you just kind of like I would have preferred. To, uh, yeah. Anyway, no, but go go see it, people. Yeah. Enjoy. Um, um, which we've brings also- us neat. Here. Two biggest disappointments of the year. Yes. So obviously, yeah, we've 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 uh, covered a few that we've talked about in the past. Some that one film I'm th- pretty sure we didn't uh, talk about. I think we talked about it being announced, maybe, but was direct to Netflix that was dropped hours after it being teased at the Super Bowl was the Cloverfield Paradox. Yeah. Interesting to hear what you th- what you think of that because I watched it and I was like. Uh, I mean, the only thing I would say about it is it's um, an interesting idea, poorly executed. <laughs> so that, I don't know what... That is being very generous to it. Yeah, I thought it was an absolute shambles. Um, it wasn't even an, an enjoyable mess. It was, yeah, as you say, it was, there was some... It could have had a lot of potential. It had a talented cast. Um, it obviously had, you know, decent budget behind it. You and I like sort of clever you know smart sci-fi with with big ideas it could have been a bit event horizon-y but it was just all over the place and just didn't make any sense was square peg round hole of them trying to cram it in to link it to the cloverfield universe and after the very smart 10 cloverfield lane you know, it's it's a real disappointment, and I think it. I wouldn't be surprised if it is the the nail in the coffin for the the Cloverfield uh, franchise, or at least you know, it's, they're not going to be so sort of flippant next time. Of oh yeah, people will go and see it's Cloverfield. 
It's, uh, yeah, J- JJ Abrams Cloverfield, people to go see it, because I think we talked about how it had started off as one film, film and then, uh, yeah, retrofitted to become a Cloverfield film. Yeah, where, whereas, um, it, 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 as you say, the nail in the coffin, that last, without going into spoiler territory, but the, <laughs> the, the, last, the last scene of the film, which is obviously meant to be like a, a punch, like, oh, wow, um, it just kind of like, I don't know, underlines all of the film's weaknesses. Whereas... On a lighter note, uh, the film Life, the last few scenes of that film, highlight why that film is just a brilliant B-movie that must be seen. Yeah, um, I, th- I think I still <laughs> haven't seen Life, but apparently I think it was, yeah, it was, it was very similar to Cloverfield, and I think that was another reason why I put people off. It's like, well, yeah, this has kind of already been done and a lot better. Much better. Yeah. Yeah, much better, much more, and much more condensed with better um, character performances, whereas because of the Cloverfield dynamic of it being a parallel universe and people not being who they used to be, you don't really know. Nobody, it's, it's almost like the, the, nobody knows what's going on. It's like all of the actors in the Cloverfield paradox are all working from different scripts. And, and I, different just, plots. I, just don't, I just didn't really care for any of them, even you know the main characters. It's just like, oh. Where, whereas, whereas in life, there's like three main characters and they all have... Do you remember Sunshine? It's kind of like they all have yeah. very, very strong. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, metaphors. They, they're, well, no, they they are. You know, like in Sunshine, how one of them is associated with being cold and the others with being hot. You know, one of them is always going into cold water and the others being exposed to the sun. Very strong metaphors. In life, it's like that. There's like three characters and they're doing very strong metaphors. And yes, it's just a creepy alien action flick, but it gets it going along. Whereas yeah, Cloverfield Paradox, great to get it, you know what I say for free, great to get it accessible through Netflix, which is part of your monthly deal, that's great, but fell flat on its face in terms of what it what it could have been and what it ended up being. Um, and in terms of kudos and woodas, it's obviously not our usual feature, but I still haven't seen The Predator yet, but speaking of nails in coffins, oh, <laughs> I've heard that about God. it. <laughs> yeah, The Predator. Uh... Um, yeah, it's a real shame. I think, uh, again, we, we, we talked about it on previous episodes. We, I think we even talked about it in our our Predator podcast, one of our first podcasts. And if you haven't checked that we out were, yet, I... yeah, please, please do uh, check out our Predator podcast. It's, uh, it's one of our uh, personal favorites. And I would advise everybody to probably start from there because our first, what, first zero, one and two episodes are really ropey in terms of audio quality. So, um yeah, pretty best to start with Predator. Yeah. It, it is a highlight. But yeah, we, we talked about it and then saying, you know, it had been announced, Shane Black was doing it, and, you know, if he couldn't turn around Predator, who could? And yeah, you know, I, I think I even said, you know, in Shane Black we trust. And this was, you know, along with, with Mission Impossible, I really had high hopes for this film, and I think that's why it sort of it hurts the most, because it was awful. I mean... I I went and saw this with uh, a good friend of ours and a uh, friend of the show, uh, George Feeney. We're both big Predator fans. We've grown up watching the films together. Uh, George is a big Alien fan as well. You know, we went there with, with open minds. And I think, you know, again, it had it had mixed to decent-ish reviews. I think some people gave it fair. I remember Denna Geek, who's one, they're one of my favourite film websites, they gave it one star. And I thought, ooh, that's a bit, bit harsh. But then I think... Uh, Empire may have given it three but yeah it was just a massive disappointment the plot is all over the place it doesn't make any sense all the characters are trying to be funny and for a Shane Black film it's actually quite surprising that a lot of the jokes don't land really yeah I mean you think even if he can't get the the sort of action side the mythology right he'd at least get some good gags in it a lot of the gags they just it's it feels like they're sort of trying to hit you over the head saying yeah this is funny right we're all having fun these guys are funny it's it's really awkward and it's it's not and it's yeah it's, it's a real shame because you know Shane Black's had a real winning streak with with his films Kiss Kiss Bang Bang Iron Man 3 I know that's not everyone's cup of tea but I think it's a very solid entry and I loved uh, the other guys with Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling I thought that was great banter good detective film 
and I yeah I just I think that's it I just had such high hopes there's uh, one or two decent scenes in the predator there's a good action scene where the, the predator is laying waste to a lot of people but then this new uber predator turns up and is a CGI mess it's really disappointing and, and it ends on a big cliffhanger that just le- left me and my friend George in complete shock for the worst way possible. Just like, oh my God, that looks awful in terms of a cliffhanger. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really don't know uh, what's going to happen uh, with that particular franchise. I can't recommend this film highly enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, five stars. And, you know, I, I, it's a little bit hypocritical with what I was saying earlier, you know, everyone's toxic film criticism, everyone's dealing in absolutes. Um, yeah, calm down, George. But Jesus. if you want a more sort of less ranty version, uh, check out my review on, on our blog. <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's go back to that middle of the road territory and start handing out some awards. So, one of the most meh films of the year, so so fifty fifty, could have been something, ended up being not much. So 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 low. Han Solo. A Hans, Star Wars buddy. <laughs> Han Solo, a Star Wars story, really. Really? You mean, if people see that name, they're going to think it's another type of story? Uh, Rogue One wasn't that, was it? Rogue One was just Rogue One. No, no, the the official umbrella term, it was Rogue One, a Star Wars story, but I think everyone called it Rogue One. But yeah, I mean, you you and I really enjoyed Rogue One. I still think it's one of the best, it's one of the best Star Wars films now, I think, looking back. Yeah, it's, it's just recently popped up on Netflix, and so I need to give it a, a revisit, but obviously I don't want to... Uh, Actually, on a complete side tangent, I caught my wife watching Rogue One on Netflix on her phone. And I just said, like, you're disrespecting the filmmakers. <laughs> Whereas I would, uh, yes, you know, obviously I do a lot of commuting and watching films on the move. But I am holding off uh, re-watching Rogue One for a big screen, either telly or getting the projector out. But yes, Absolutely. Yeah, Solo, again, like, everyone was jumping on online saying, you know what, everyone thought it was going to be a complete disaster, and it's not, it's, it's, it's okay. And yeah, that's it, you know, it's, it's middling entertainment, and I don't know if that's just damning it with faint praise, I don't really know. Well, no, I, th- I thought a lot of people have said the same sort of thing about Solo, as they have said about, um that film with Lady Gaga and which name I'm not going to talk about, but they also, and it, it's what reinforces my theory, uh, which is they're all bots, you know? I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised. Everyone saying the same thing about the film. Um, it just, it just thinks of it being, you know, actual automatic software that's making these posts as opposed to people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they think that it hasn't been a, hu- a huge success it hasn't been a big enough success it's been the lowest grossing star wars film and it's given sort of disney a pause for thought and they've said oh yeah maybe we shouldn't be we released it too soon after last jedi but yeah because last jedi was quite divisive as well exactly so by the sounds of it they're doing some interesting the new star wars spin-off show uh the mandalorian sounds very interesting you've got some very good people behind the camera on that and they've just announced the cast on that so you've pedro pascal who's uh, very good in narcos and i think he's been in game of thrones he's been in the kingsman sequel he is the the lead character but the, yeah very varied cast who's there there's nick nolte juan carlo esposito who plays gus fring from breaking bad and bat call saul he's in it carl weathers is in it so just so stupid <laughs> So, yeah, I think uh, maybe that might be the best course for, for Star Wars is some hourly episodes of different planets, different characters, and less expectation. Yeah, yeah, but turn it down a notch. Yeah. Going on to some awards in terms of films, I'll go through these because I, I, I know that we, we've chatted about these, George, so funniest film. Do you want to take, it, take that one? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we do struggle for comedies, really. There seem to be few and far between uh, in modern cinema. As you know, as we've said, it seems to be all about sequels, prequels, and remakes. 
I searched out recently, there was uh, a lot of people recommending Game Night. Yeah, and I, I really enjoyed it. So it's got uh, Jason Bateman, Rachel McAdams. It's got some really good good people in it, good cast. And I really recommend yeah, seeking that out. So it's uh, basically about these competitive couples that have a board game night. And then Jason Bateman's uh, older brother that he's very competitive with decides to up the stakes and doing like a sort of a live murder mystery sort of type theatrical immersive theater type thing and as you can predict it all goes wrong and mixed messages you know a bit like that um that film we used to enjoy with bill murray you know the man who knew too little it's a bit like that yeah as uh, like yeah, a, a, com- okay. a comedy of errors for a comedy it's a comedy film it's really interestingly shot some quite cool scenes and camera angles and things like that so yeah so if you're looking for a decent comedy for 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 date night uh choose game night uh it rolls off the tongue so i'm going to quickly go through these so uh best actor or actress of films from this year oh uh best actor i mean obviously props has got to go to tom cruise for his the lengths that man will go to to entertain i've already talked about um you know rami malek's brilliant performances as freddy uh, any any others that you'd want to throw into the pot? Um, well, just because it's been so long ago, but I've just I, I know that we're going to be covering it. We're going to cover art house films, aren't we? In a few moments. Um, yeah. The non blobbers. Um, but from three billboards. Yeah, I thought that is she um, Francis um, McDormand. She's married to one of the girls. Is it one of the Coen brothers? Yes. Or have I, yeah, I think wrong it's 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 Joel. And if it's not Joel, it's Ethan. Uh, Ethan. I thought her performance in that was stunning. and I thought I think all the performances performance. in that film were great. I mean, obviously, Woody Harrelson was brilliant in that film. Sam Rockwell is is uh, one of my favourite actors. I love him yeah, it was, and everything. Who, she, who, I mean, we didn't really cover it. We'll, we'll cover it in the... We'll talk about the, um, the director of that because, yeah, I mean, there was... Everybody in that film was amazing, but I just thought she encaptured it so well. And I think the response from my wife when we were leaving it going, she was really into it. She was just annoyed that it was a film and not a new Netflix series. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's how she felt about it. That she was so invested in the characters and the story and the plot. She was a bit upset that it because it does kind of you know end on a on a sort of cliff or or of a what's going to come next. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's ambiguous. Spoiling it, it's, it's an ambiguous ending. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that I haven't. There's a few. I think there's a few big films that I haven't seen, um, which I, I, I guess we just cover it now. Films that. We we still need to see that would probably that have come out this year that would probably cover that are things like uh, I'm sure First Man and maybe Black Handsman um, have probably have some great performances in them and there's probably a few others that we haven't covered. Yeah, uh, well, obviously we're, yeah we're getting into that sort of Oscars window at the moment and obviously Three Billboards was released in the UK in in 2018 but it was released in the states uh, end of last year. In terms of other sort of indie art house stuff, uh, I recently watched The Post by Sp- Steven Spielberg with Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep. You're never going to get a bad performance out of those two. Uh, and it's actually a really gripping story, very relevant, all about the sort of freedom of the press. They get their hands on top secret. It's not the Watergate papers, but it's basically the papers that reveal that the the government have been doing with the Vietnam War, all that, you know, the, the fact they keep pouring in troops, even though they knew it was a going to be a disaster. And amazingly, I think Spielberg made that film whilst the effects for Ready Player One were being completed. So he did that in his downtime for a bunch of people in newsrooms uh, talking very quickly. It's a very gripping character piece. I'd I'd really recommend that. I I, I was really impressed by it. I definitely want to check that out. And I I didn't get around to it, but I have heard some some very good things about yeah. it. And on a similar note, there's Molly's Game. I did actually watch at the cinema at the start of the year, which is Aaron Sorkin, him, the writer of West Wing and the Facebook film, uh, sorry, Social Network. Uh, it's his directorial debut. And as you would expect, it's very rapid fire dialogue, but a good uh, central performance from Jessica Chastain. Big Driss Elba, he turns up. Uh, Kevin Costner is in it as well. So it's got some good good actors in it. And that's, yeah, that's worth a watch as well. I'm confused about that because I think this might be the way that they do some great French titling. What's her full character name in that film? It's Molly... 
Oh, no, you, there is another film with Jessica Chastain called Miss Sloan. Miss Sloan? Oh, yeah. right, so it wasn't that one. No, okay, yeah, okay. no. No, this is all about, it's a woman that arranged very high-level poker games between the rich and the famous in, in, in yeah, LA. Well. No, I think I've seen the trailer for that. No, the the funniest one was the uh, <laughs> the the accountant with Ben Affleck was renamed in France uh, oh. the Yanokist. <laughs> oh right, I know because yeah, you remember saying was was it was it called like Mister Wolf or something? Because that's his name. His name oh, no. like, is is surname is Wolf in the film. They uh, had two. I think I think they had two here in France. They had the Yanokist and Mister Wolf. Nice or Mister Wolf call. They really go creative here in France. I do like it when they're like, oh, just, no, that doesn't make any sense. This makes much more sense. Yeah. No, it doesn't. So there's also, in the art house indie stuff, there's Bad Times at El Royale, which is very, you know, a bit pulp fiction-y, lots of short stories all linked, uh, some very good actors and actresses in it. Great soundtrack. It's been one of my sort of downloaded soundtracks uh, of recent months. So, yeah, I'd recommend checking that out. I really want to see that. It's the Mal Tomp at the anyway. I'm not going to give you the French title, yeah. but yeah, I, I really want to see that. It's got it's got the your your man crush, uh, Don Draper, you, John Hamm. And you, you leave that delicious John Hamm alone. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, 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 I hear that Jeff Bridges is very good. In that yes, as well. he's well. Yeah, Jeff Bridges is very on very good form, and there's. Um, a new actress on the scene, I think she's a British actress called Cynthia Erivo, who's fantastic in it. She does all this uh, Motown uh, acapella songs throughout the film that bizarrely don't pop up on the soundtrack. Apparently she is a sort of a star to keep an eye out on in terms of a breakout actress. But going back to our awards, so what's the best character of the year? I mean, I think you and I, well, you and I weren't the only ones, but I think everyone fell in love with uh, Josh Brolin's Thanos from the Avengers Infinity War. He was an amazing villain that didn't disappoint. Yeah, deep. Yeah, he had he had a lot to him. He was suffering. Yeah, yeah, very, very good character. And I don't know what that says about the other films of, of this year. But I do, I do think what it says a lot about where we are in terms of how we're consuming film and series is that I think he's probably the best character from film. But there's probably one or two other characters from streaming who I watch, you know, who have to maintain it over seasons and seasons. But yeah, he's definitely the most interesting character. But he's already proven he can act. You know, he's uh, obviously well established, but to to doll up and all the CGI and CGI stubble. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they had to, uh, they really went to town on his effect. But a great performance, and it, and it, and uh, you know, jokingly, you know, Avengers: The Infinity War. It was what a, a Thanos standalone film, really, when you look at it compared to all the other Marvel films. It, yeah, yeah, that's that's, 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 that's very true. It'll be interesting to see what what his role is in the new one. People are rumoring, saying that there'll be another threat that and the Avengers whether they need to team up with Thanos. But I hope that's not the case because that sounds a bit formulaic. I hope he's just not in it. You know, that scene from the trailer of his of his armor hanging up, and I just hope he's got his feet up. No, no, I've done my thing. No, I'm I'm done. I'm yeah. done. <laughs> so, a best supporting character for me, it's got to go to I think because he's uh, turned up in two films that we've talked about, Woody Harrelson. Um, but kind of, I actually liked him in Solo. I thought he was underused in that, and I think he, uh, the, but. For me, the, it's a, it's a between him and uh, Sam Rockwell in uh, Three Billboards. Yes. For me, as supporting actors, their performances were almost jarring. You know, they were I don't know. I I just I could watch that film, and I already think very highly of these guys. You know, so to see them do what they did in that film in supporting roles says a lot about them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, um, but in terms of who else, uh, best supporting character, I think, you know, shout out does have to go out to Henry Cavill's mustache from Mission Impossible. Obviously, that has, <laughs> he has created, you know, that, that guy's got a lot of press coverage. I can't, what I can't believe is that a man's facial hair has affected but like two billion dollars worth of films. <laughs> yes, crazy. yes, it has. And it looked marvellous. So, well, I've talked about my sort of, uh, in terms of best soundtracks, I've yeah really enjoyed, obviously, Bohemian Rhapsody. I One of the things I did uh, after watching the film was I immediately went to Spotify and downloaded the very best of Queen. Well, for me, it was kind of like, that's why I knew I was going to enjoy that film, whatever, because, yeah, I was very much late to the party 
very, very late to the party. We're talking after Live Aid, after, you know, all of that sort of stuff. It was, uh, you know, I got into it very late, but I, I think just as you love the music, who doesn't love the music? It's why the film's done so well. But going to see that film, I was like, look, whatever happens, there's going to be a lot of, I know that I know I'm going to love the soundtrack. And it was, it was just a funny thing to be watching the film and going, like what tunes coming next like they could yeah. just there's so much queen to choose from that it's like well we'll just choose this and we'll just choose that and obviously they were going to go for a lot of the the floor fillers but they were used very well i would well, argue well that's they were used- to be fair they credit must go like i would say in terms of one of the best trailers of the year was the, i think the first teaser trailer for bohemian rhapsody which did a sort of a mega mix of the of all their tunes but it was done really cool it was a bit of a sort of yeah i say a, a mashup um, yeah i enjoyed that as well and i think that we will rock you and the way that it was because it was condensed into a two-minute trailer and you're like i think i could i could do a listening to that before i go into work every day yeah <laughs> Very but yeah and obviously i haven't seen the film that you won't stop banging on about the soundtrack with um john ham and jeff bridges in the unfortunately, good times the yeah, unfortunately john ham yeah. doesn't do any singing but i imagine if john ham was to sing he would have an amazing voice you are imagining him just singing you this as a lullaby, yeah. While your while your wife is watching um, Rogue One on her phone, you're watching John Hamm on I'm, yours. I'm just watching a slideshow of John Hamm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose we. I suppose you've got to look a bit uh, before we look back too much. Uh, we can look forward to next year. Oh, I know what we'll cover before we talk about stuff we haven't seen and what's coming up. Best, what have you enjoyed reviewing? With me, kind brother, this year. What's been your favourite uh, Retro Ramble episode? Uh, to be completely self, self-indulgent uh, for to, to completely talk about how what I liked about me and and you. No, we we I think we've we've covered some really good films this year. Obviously, we've we've done some big ones. I enjoyed uh, our Back to the Future chat. I think that was you know it's obviously a, a big film of ours growing up. And it was great to to cover that to scratch that itch. I had a lot of fun with our first proper guest with with Husey doing the Untouchables. Mission Impossible, obviously I was, I think we were both sort of so geared up about seeing the, the new one that was great to do, both Mission Impossible 1 and 2. Yeah, yeah, for me it was more, you know, we've done some mammoth films, like it's very difficult, you know, we're doing, we, we're, we're more established or well, we feel more established in terms of how we're doing the episodes, we feel more comfortable, but to cover films like Back to the Future, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Die Hard this year, three of my, you know, definitely top 10 films of all time um they were i think that doing a film like that put us i felt under pressure don't know about you doing those films but yeah like you, you you wouldn't know you really want to give those films the 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 justice that they deserve the, the care and the attention and you, and at the same time you know we don't want these to be complete lovings of oh it's it's put this film so perfect you know with stuff like Raiders of the lost ark those films are and you know die hard back to the future they are near perfect but it's interesting i think for us in terms of why they're still perfect why they're still held in such high regard and the really interesting behind the scenes stories that they all have well yeah because so much time has passed but yeah i'd say so the big films that we did it felt like the most pressure the most fun i think we had was definitely on the untouchables um with husey not only because he knows us brian brian de palma brought something different but because that film means so much for us and it was it's always good fun to do Sean and Connery impressions with Husey. Um so uh but I think the most kind of retro ramble, which is I me and you doing what the reason why we decided to do this podcast, which is us looking back on the on the real films of our youth, it would be um the John Claude Van Damme special and Tango and Cash, because these were the films we were watching when we didn't know any better, you know, <laughs> before we had proper opinions. And I think when I'm looking back at them now, it's, it's actually, those were quite, um, those were fun episodes to do. And once again, we apologize to all of the people who seriously think that Tango and Cash is a very good film. Because we really, <laughs> we really love it, but some people didn't appreciate us. Uh, the way that we took the piss out of it. We, uh, yeah, we had too much fun with it, apparently. But don't worry, because uh, we've got some more Stallone comedy coming in 2019. So uh, oh. we, we can rub those feathers uh, again uh, for, for next year. OK, well, and looking forward, yeah, I mean, films still to see. Uh, I don't think either of us have seen any of these. Uh, George Sicario 2, Black Klansman. I mean, that's already out. First Man, Into the Spider-Verse, Aquaman, yeah. uh, Bumblebee. 
Yeah, so Into the Spider-Verse is, is getting amazing reviews, so I'm really keen to see that. Right. Uh, um, hopefully you and I can, uh, over Christmas, can run away from our wives and our families and sneak out to the cinema and see one of those films, so whether it's uh, Into the Spider-Verse, uh, Aquaman, or Bumblebee. I think Bumblebee's getting very good reviews, probably because it hasn't been directed by Michael Bay. Um, <laughs> uh, and Aquaman, I think, will fill that void of no Star Wars, of big screen extravaganza. I think it'll be, whilst it might not be the best film, I think it'll be a good feast for the eyeballs. Yeah, so I guess people just need to stay tuned to the blog. We, we're we going to be covering some great films uh, next year. Um, we'll continue doing the what we've been referring to a lot in this episode, and I do apologise. If you haven't listened to any of our recent Ramble episodes, but just like this review of 2018, uh, the recent Rambles are just things that we do not every month, but to kind of fill a gap or there's been a few blockbusters where we just try to, well, just just the fact, just to prove that George and I not only are looking back on films from yesteryear, we're still very much interested and, and have opinions. And if you're willing to, inter- in, you know, if you want to listen to them, download the episodes. But um Lots of stuff coming up in two, in 2019. Yes, yeah, we've got some uh, we've got some big films. We've got a nice mix of classic sort of 80s and 90s action films, but also some family f- favourites as well thrown into the mix. Obviously, there's a few uh, anniversaries for for films next year. But yeah, as always, uh, if let us know uh, if there's any films that you think that we should cover that we think that we would we would have fun with. But yeah, thank you to all the support from from all of our our listeners uh, across the the interwebs, and thank you for sharing and uh, yeah. especially the sharers because we've had more sharing. This sharing is caring, but this year it's been crazy how many uh, people have, have got back to us and said that they've heard about us because they've been recommended by one of their friends. So we really do appreciate that. Yeah, and we've had yeah some lovely feedback. So yeah, thank you it does mean a lot to us, and it, it keeps us going. But uh, if you haven't, you know, moment to leave us a quick review on iTunes because it does help with our sort of awareness. Cool. Okay. Well, um, we will be back, obviously, in January with a brand new episode. Um, We will announce that via the blog and social media uh, because it's probably the easiest way. I don't know. Is there there anything else we need to cover, George, before we sign off? No. um, I mean, it depends on when people are listening to this, but uh, we hope you've had a a good 2018. Uh, If you haven't, uh, have a good 2019. Uh, A Merry Christmas, and uh, we'll, we'll see you on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. Merry New Year. Enjoy Christmas. And uh, we'll see you on the flip side. I've been Charlie McGee. I've been George McGee. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.